Okay, you got in a homicularish take of wisdom. Yeah, I hear like talk. Anyway, how false you rover, Fadish talk, be trusted in a tear and up to reach. I should go home to a bear rash if we're down on sun. Um, Lemarian Akerman, August, I'm a Sulga Moral Show, not his father in law, Grim, a part of Trasten it here. But it's great to be back again. Uh, another fantastic evening with Trasten it here. And we have another fantastic lecture coming up with Marion Akerman. I'm really looking forward to um, having been part of the excavations way back when, which is found out about 14 years ago or so, um, of, of 976 uh, famine victims in the McDonough Junction uh, workhouse. Um, and if any of you have any questions during the lecture, just pop them into the comments down below and I'll um, put them to Marion. Marion towards the end. But I'm going to hand you over. You don't see my face anymore. Over to Marion. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, I got a bit nervous there when you introduced me in Irish. I thought, oh my gosh, I didn't get the brief that this was to be an Irish lecture. So uh, it won't be an Irish lecture. <laughs> we'll just get that straight from the beginning. Um, hello to everyone. And uh, it's, it's lovely to see you. I'm just going to uh, share my screen here. Now, I hope everyone can see that there now. Um, so welcome to uh, this lecture uh, about the Kilkenny famine experience. I was uh, a little bit unsure as to the audience, so I'm, I'm going to cover a little bit of the famine history in Kilkenny, and then I'm going to talk about what happened at McDonough Junction, and then I'm going to go into the new side of the experience and, and, and why we did what we did, I suppose. So apologies to uh, those of you that may know uh, all of the heritage and the history already, but I'll be uh, as quick as I can and we'll run through it. So um, the Kilkenny Union Workhouse uh, is built on the site um, at McDonough Junction Shopping Centre. It was built in 1842 and it was built to accommodate up to 1300 local poor people. The buildings were built in response to a need for social welfare in Ireland um, and previously that had been taken care of under Brehan law, so the native laws dating back to Celtic times and at that time rulers uh, were to take care of the sick and the poor. Uh, in the fifth century Christianity came to Ireland and with it monasteries began to develop um, over time and those monasteries took on the role of caring for the less fortunate. From the mid 1500s, Ireland was invaded by Pro Protestant English settlers and the land was taken from the Irish. The lig religious were prosecuted and the whole care system broke down. Um, and then in 1800, under the Act of Union, Ireland became part of Britain. Numerous committees were set up to investigate extreme poverty in Ireland, but nothing was done. However, as more and more Irish people flocked to Britain in search of employment, the British government acted and they sent over one of the English Poor Law Commissioners, George Nichols, to find a solution. Um, it was his first time in Ireland and uh, he did a tour around the country and he reported back that Ireland needed a workhouse system similar to the English one. And the Irish Poor Law became, sorry, the Irish Poor Law Act became law in 1838. So this is the Kilkenny Union Workhouse. Um, the situation was so bad that at, by the beginning of the 1800s, it was estimated that some 2.3 million people were near starvation levels. At the time, Ireland's population was nearing 8 million. Uh, and by this time also, most of Ireland's small farmers and landless laborers were dependent on potato as their main food source. When the potato famine began in 1845, this poor house quickly became the city famine workhouse. And the workhouse system was a shining beacon for the Victorian belief in inspiring the poor to better themselves and making the alternative a brutal and degrading experience. Uh, most workhouses were built to an identical blueprint drawn up by architect George, George Wilkinson. Uh, they were designed to segregate men and women, boys and girls, and that was to heighten the trauma of presenting at the doors. And at the time, Kilkenny was the fifth largest workhouse in Ireland, and a lot of people are surprised by that fact. Um, it served as the city famine workhouse between the years of 1845 and 1852, uh, and during that time it housed at one stage uh, a staggering 4,357 local men, women and children. That was at the height of the famine in 1851. Now that number also included some indoor relief um, through um, other buildings across the city as well, but this was the main um, workhouse for the city. Uh, and as you can imagine, the living conditions were really, really bad. Um, 
the workhouse only accepted orphans, complete families, or the very old, insane and infirm. And the workhouse system was designed to give only the deserving poor access. So that meant that people on the verge of starvation were allowed to enter. And recordings of the minutes state that the test for allowing access at the height of the famine was that if one person was unlikely to be alive by the time the next board of guardians were to meet and they met once a week. So you really had to be, you know, at, on your last legs to, to gain entry. Um, if we look at the lay, layout of the workhouse, um, the men's yard, and specifically Kilkenny, the men's yard is where um, Workhouse Square is today. So that's the section um, at McDonough with the covered glass roof. And you can see it on the right hand side of this photograph here. Uh, the women's yard was just over the roof from that. So that's the, uh, the yard to the left hand side of the photograph. And to the front uh, were the children's yards. So the boys were at the front of the men's yard and the girls were at the front of the women's yard. Um, children were only allowed to stay with their parents until they reached the age of two, and then they were forced to separate into the children's yards. And um, it's telling of the stress that caused for them because uh, research into the famine remains that were found at McDonough show a, a spike in infant mortality between the age of two and three. So it demonstrated that separation obviously had a fatal effect on, on children whose immune systems were already very vulnerable. Uh, some of the stories from the workhouse uh, and the, the newspapers of the time um, record two women that were expelled from the workhouse. They tried to scale the wall from the women's yard just to catch a glimpse of the children because you could only uh, spend time with your children once a week and you had to have that, um, you had to have an appointment to see them. So it was, it all fed into the um, whole theory that you tried to um, defer pe deter people from coming to the door seeking entry. Um, and you can see at the front of this building as well was the uh, reception building. And uh, that's where the Board of Guardians would have, would have met once a week. And uh, other stories tell that all but two of the Board of Guardians who would have been very uh, wealthy and well thought of people in the community, uh, but all but two of them uh, never stepped across the threshold of the workhouse at the height of the famine. Um, and there are stories of um, specifically the men's yards being in a very poor state of order, uh, every piece of glass broken in the windows, uh, piles of rags in, in the courtyards. Um, I think the women were a little bit better at keeping their, their, their stuff in order, uh, according to the, the records. So with all the research carried out on site and reading from the minute books uh, from the Board of Guardians, it's noteworthy that the children were actually looked after quite well. They were schooled um, and there are notes of several schoolmasters being dismissed for dishing out beatings to the boys in the workhouse. Um, so while the archaeologists examined the juvenile skeletal remains, there's virtually no evidence of bone uh, damage through trauma with the children, uh, which is, I suppose, somewhat nice to hear. Um, the, the Board of Guardians were actually quite complimentary in talking about the children and the girls in particular, referring to them as um, clever and intelligent. And they felt that they were actually rescuing these children from their uh, parents who were considered lazy. Uh, if we look at the social consequences of the famine, they're uh, also interesting. There's many cases of social unrest in Ireland during the famine, and these occurred in Kilkenny as well, and actually were reported worldwide. Um, in 1846, Swedish newspapers wrote about social unrest and near riot situations in Kilkenny. Uh, reports of overcrowded and critical situations in the Kilkenny workhouse was also picked up by Dutch newspapers at the time. So starvation, of course, affects people's mental health, causes apathy, and um, they can break down the emotional bonds between family members. Um, and there are accounts from the west of Ireland uh, of parents killing their children, taking food from their children, and also cases of cannibalism in Galway. So, you know, dire times. Um, that could be a scenario that explains why many children were abandoned to the workhouse during the famine. And um, I suppose a lot of parents also emigrated, uh, le leaving their children behind them um, uh, in an attempt to kind of save, send some money home. Uh, and that story is echoed um, later on when we talk about um, John and Patrick Saul. So the story of the stories coming from the workhouses uh, and specifically the Kilkenny Workhouse, 
uh, were always of interest to me. But this story in particular is kind of the seed that sowed the start of the Kilkenny famine experience. And it's the story of John and Patrick Saul. So it tells a story of two children aged 12 and 15, John and Patrick Saul. They were given access to stay in the workhouse just for a couple of nights. They were on their way back from Dublin to Clanmel and they reported that they had walked from Clanmel to Dublin with their parents with a view to leaving and emigrating to Sydney. But their parents actually abandoned them in Dublin and left them to wander the streets. And they then started to make their way back to Clanmel. Their parents actually went on to Sydney without them. Um, and as they approached Kilkenny, they would have seen the workhouse. Um, the workhouse was only open a couple of months and they knocked on the door and they asked for shelter for a few nights and that they would continue on then to Clanmel that, where they had relations that would um, take care of them. And you can see here this expert excerpt from the Kilkenny Journal uh, talks about how the Board of Guardians were uh, affected by their story and that they were admitted. So that's just one of the human stories coming through from the Kilkenny uh, workhouse, um, which obviously triggered um, the tour and uh, triggered interest in, from a lot of people in, um, in those boys in particular. So we look at Kilkenny back at the time, these are actually two photographs taken around the time of um, the famine. And you can see obviously the beautiful Kilkenny Castle Gardens here on the right hand side and some of the uh, recognizable architecture in the background there with the, the steeples um, of St. Mary's um, shining through there. And then um, a typical, and that would probably have been a high quality dwelling house uh, in this other photograph. So Kilkenny at the time was actually quite affluent. Um, it had a thriving mill and a, it actually had a great retail trade. Um, and it was known as a retail destination even back then. And it's reported that the city actually became a magnet for the starving rural dwellers. Once the famine struck, um, they descended on the city in their hundreds. And there was reports of crowds of beggars on the streets of Kilkenny. Um, interestingly, and apt at the moment, because we're dealing with the Ukrainian refugees who've become displaced and working to help um, assist there. But at the time during the famine, there was reports of uh, refugee camps on Brogmaker Hill um, and two other areas in the city. So uh, a story from the newspaper at the time tells of a man who traveled to Kenny by coach. Uh, he stopped most likely at the parade and he was eating a gooseberry and he threw the skin of the gooseberry down onto the ground and a woman pounced on it and placed it into the mouth of her child um, to just give them some nutrition. And that story is it's actually recorded in uh, 1838. So that was actually pre, uh, before the main famine took hold in Kilkenny. So things were, were quite stark even back then. Um, I just want to talk about the discovery of the burial ground. So there was no burial designated plot uh, for the Kilkenny workhouse um, when it was initially established. And at, in the beginning, local cemeteries uh, would have taken on the, the burials from the workhouse. Uh, but what happened was the local graveyard started to fill um, and uh, uh, an instruction was sent across to the Board of Guardians to stop sending uh, paupers um, to the, the local graveyard. So you can see here uh, an advertisement um, in the local newspaper asking for land, but actually no land was available at the time. So uh, a decision was made that between August 1847 and March 1851, um, that a burial ground was used within the grounds of the workhouse as far away as possible uh, from the buildings. You can see at the top of that um, illustration from Johnny Gieber's book that the burial ground was actually within the boundary, but as far away from the main dwelling. And it's likely that that was to try and prevent uh, spread of disease. And there was a cinder path discovered between the workhouse um, down to the burial ground as well, where people would have walked down uh, with the coffins. So uh, after the famine, obviously there might have been an intentional um, effort to conceal the burial grounds presence uh, it was deliberately covered with a thick layer of sterile soil and it was later used as the workhouse garden. It was never marked on the maps um, and it was common at the time obviously to be ashamed of any connection with the famine uh, and the poverty that was experienced in, at the time. So it wouldn't have been spoken about openly. 
So by the time of its discovery in 2005, there was no local traditions that existed uh, around the burial ground um, and the find was completely unanticipated. Um, now, there was archaeologists on site because obviously the, the sensitive nature of the site and they were expecting to find a couple of bodies, but obviously the extent of this burial site was completely unanticipated. So this was what was happening in 2007. So while um, excavation work was starting at the shopping centre, and you can see there the good shed um, on pile driven uh, reinforcements as the diggers started to excavate down. Um, and just as they were nearing excavate, the, the, the end of their excavation, they discovered 69 burial pits. Um, in the far corner of the site and, and obviously everything was stopped at that stage um, and that obviously necessitated then a very large scale um, piece of work by the archaeologists so evaluation work in 2005 was carried out by Colleen O'Driscoll of Kilkenny Archaeology and that's how he was on site when the remains were discovered and that then spurred an extensive archaeological excavation by Brenda O'Mara of Margaret Gowan and Co Limited, and that's part of the work that Ben mentioned earlier that he was involved in with as well. So you can see here the archaeologists working away and some of the burial pits. There were at least 970 human remains discovered in 63 mass burial pits on the site. This is the largest excavation of its kind in the history of the state. And what it does is gives us a unique chance to examine the deaths of malnutrition and the illness suffered at the time of death of the victims. So the victims were buried in cheap pine coffins and uh, it was documented that a wake usually preceded the burial, which is testament to the determination of people to give their loved ones a decent burial. Space was very tight uh, and the burial pits piled one coffin on top of another and often parents and infants were found buried together. Um, in one of the burial pits, um, a, an infant was nestled in the crook of a parent's forearm and you can see here in one of our photographs as well, we have a child uh, on the left hand side and then on the right hand side, you can see an infant and an adult buried together. And it's thought that these may not have been related, but it was to save space in one of the coffins because the child is down at the feet of the, of the adult. There is actually no evidence of the use of sliding coffins uh, at our burial site, um, which is also an interesting uh, element of the, the history of the site. The remains were removed um, from McDonough Junction and uh, they went to Dublin where extensive osteoanalysis was carried out. Um, and this discovery was described as the most significant discovery in the world relating to the Irish famine. We've had no excavation of this size, no access to human remains on this scale. There's been maybe 10 or 20 uh, famine victims found before and been available for analysis. So really, um, it's really, really significant for Kilkenny and very significant for Ireland as well, um, that the experts were allowed to see exactly what was going on at the time. There's very little written documentation from the inmates of the workhouses as well, because they wouldn't have um, typically have been uh, people that would write down or, or been able to, to write the, the, what was going on in the workhouses from their perspective. The written records are always or usually from the either the newspapers or the Board of Guardians, you know, who just would have had a different perspective on things as well. So scientific testing has actually led to proven new findings relating to how people lived and died during the famine of 1840s in Ireland. And uh, many researchers traveled to Ireland to examine our remains and that find, the, the findings have attracted worldwide acclaim. So the workhouses were known as death houses and once you entered you were unlikely to leave and the minute books recall a story of a married couple who fought about this the husband refused to stay he insisted that they leave to escape disease uh, despite the wife begging him to stay in order to save the children from starvation but obviously he didn't relent and that meant that the family had to leave and um, she wouldn't have been allowed to stay without him there um, the remains that we found um, had advanced and severe symptoms of many diseases and scurvy was the predominant disease and was present in 499 of the 970 remains and just to say all of this osteoarchaeological 
archaeological uh, research has come from Johnny Gieber's uh, research on these remains. And you can see here a uh, skeletal remain, a, a skull with uh, scurvy uh, evidence um, uh, in the form of small holes like woodworm and generally found on the temple and around the teeth sockets and the palates. And it's found that this skeletal damage only takes hold when uh, vitamin C is reintroduced into a person's diet after a prolonged period of its absence. So it's imagined that uh, the people that were forced into the workhouse receive vitamin C in the food once they got inside the walls um, in the form of milk and vegetables. And paired with large scale outbreaks of typhus, the victims often died in a lot of pain as a result of their weakened immune system. Um, and just interestingly with scurvy, it wasn't recorded in any of the minutes um, or any of the medical reports. Um, and it's understood that the doctors that were working inland rarely came across it. So it's thought that um, it was misdiagnosed that these people may have been getting treated for gastroenteritis problems when in fact scurvy was the problem. Um, so that's another interesting element that's come from the research as well. Um, there was an also extreme manifestation of an infectious condition named osteomyelitis and it was so severe it would have occurred long before the famine but it does tell you something about the living conditions of the people in Kilkenny at the time. Osteomyelitis is an infection that spreads via the blood and it builds up on the inside of the bones. It can produce pus and that eventually breaks through the bone and skin. It is severely painful and it causes a lot of pain and fever. Porotic hyperostosis or symmetrical osteoporosis was found in 20% of the skeletal remains of the children. And that's a pathological condition that affects the bones of the cranial vault. It's characterized by local areas of spongy or porous bone tissue. And the spongy tissue within the bones of the cranium, it swells and the tissue on the outer surface becomes thinner and more porous in appearance. And that again is caused by severe malnutrition and a lack of iron in the diet. Um, and then there was other illnesses such as syphilis, typhus, um, which actually claimed 68 people in one week alone in April, 1847. And a lot of dental caries, uh, again, very prevalent, uh, which led to weakened bones and joints and severe pain for the sufferers. So the people that were in our workhouse uh, were not in good health by any means uh, and would have had a lot of pain and there was there was a, uh, definitely a lack of pain relief um, they, were, they were using wine for um, pain relief and I think the nurses were reported to be drinking more wine than than uh, giving it out to the to the people that were ill um, the man on the right hand side here you can see he has a gaping hole uh, in his skull and that's not caused by trauma or any um, degradation of his skeleton remain. That hole in his skull is actually a symptom of very advanced syphilis. And he would have actually, that would have been there while he was alive. Um, so he would have been in a, massively in pain, but also completely insane. And it's thought that that's why he gained entry into the workhouse. He would have been housed in the idiot's ward, which actually is, um, now in McDonough Junction where the barber shop is. So that part of the building was the, ma the male idiot's ward was what it was called at the time, or the asylum. Um, there was a lot of, um, th there was actually reports of a lot of prostitution at the time because the, uh, the army barracks was close by and women obviously needed to um, get money to feed themselves and their families. So it's uh, this kind of interesting social, social aspect to stories as well. Uh, that we might necessarily think about. Um, so um, in regards to how uh, the use of the burial site ended, um, this here is Shank Yard. And um, what happened in, at the workhouse was one of the mass graves uh, was found to be empty and it's presumed it was dug to accommodate more bodies that didn't actually come. Um, and that happened because graveyard space became available in March, 1851. And then burials on site ceased Im uh, immediately. So it's telling that the Board of Guardians knew that they were doing something that they really shouldn't have been doing, burying an unconsecrated ground. Um, so the Board of Guardians, as we know, had been seeking an alternative plot of land for some time, and they bought what is known as Shank Yard, just up the road um, from McDonough Junction, where Marble City Fuels is today. And there was 20 burials here on this ground. Um, until it was discovered that a Protestant had been buried amongst um, the Catholics. So
So the bishop actually refused to consecrate the ground. And after that time, then St. Kieran Cemetery was purchased and that was used for burials. And that's the location of that, that area now. So, you know, a lot of people, a lot of historians have said to me over the years, there are burials all over Ireland. You know, we don't even think about it sometimes, but there was a lot of people, you know, buried at the time in places that are now completely, you know, not, not described as such. So it's kind of interesting to think about those things as well. Um, the famine continued for another year. But at that stage, the prime minister in the UK, Robert Peel, decided to import maize from America in 1846 and 47 in an effort to alleviate the suffering that was distributed to supplement the workhouse rations. And it was also available to the public through soup kitchens throughout the city. And the remains from our site showed three individuals aged six, seven and 13 who had evidence of rapid bone growth um, and an evidence of a shift from a potato to a maize diet. But unfortunately, that maize relief came too late for those three individuals. So the remains at our site were removed um, and they were returned to us then in May 2010. Um, and they were reinterred in a memorial garden at the site at Goodshed Square. And um, there was a multi-denominational ceremony at the time and it was attended by all the major churches in the city. Um, and I suppose, <coughs> from my perspective, I'd been working at McDonough since 2007 and um, I started to take people on tours um, a little bit like just the, the, the lecture that I've just given um, and I'm not a historian so this, this is the work of, of other people kind of feeding stories to me at the time. And when I used to bring people on tours, we would always finish at Memorial Garden and it was quite nondescript. There was nothing, um, it, it, it just wasn't, um, it wasn't good enough, in my opinion. And, and a lot of people had said to me, um, I didn't know about this. They didn't know about the burials. Um, and there was a real need for people to hear stories and more of the human stories. So I knew at that stage more and more uh, tours started coming to me uh, and I said this this is just not professional enough and we're, it's not good enough and we need to do more for these pe people and more for the people at the crypt and that's how the famine experience uh, project started so we'll go into that a little bit now so this is McDonough Junction now and from this angle you can see some of the landmarks so you can see the, the trains, uh, the old train station and the good shed, which is refurbished and part of our land there. So the, the trains used to pull into the train station and offload into that good shed there. Um, from there, they may go back onto trains, onto Castlecombe or, or be distributed around the city. You can see at the back of the photograph, and I'll just move on to a better photograph. Uh, you can see here, uh, drone footage from the perspective looking down at McDonough and you can see the glass roofs there over the old buildings of um, the Famine Workhouse. So you start to see the crisscross um, design of the workhouse and those two apex roofs that you can see there were actually the men's dormitory buildings. And there was another one of those at the other side which actually was demolished, which is an awful pity, but we have possibly the most accessible um, workhouse in the country in terms of disability access and modernization and re restoration of the, the fabric of the building. So we're fortunate in that regard. And it's very important that we remember the history and uh, we continue to honor it. This is Workhouse Square now, which would have been the men's yard of um, the Kilkenny Union Workhouse. And you can see there, um, much different from workhouse times. There are stories that, um, the Board of Guardians got a little bit cross with, with the men at the, uh, in the workhouse at one stage and they brought in 19 tons of rock and they landed it into the, the workhouse square and they told the men that they were to break the rocks um, in, the workhouse, in the men's yard. Um, and that week, um, more than 20 of the male inmates as they were termed at the time left the workhouse, they wouldn't they wouldn't do the work, but you can see now that obviously Workhouse Square is a uh, much more social, welcoming uh, part of Kilkenny's uh, 
community and that's the Goodshed Square. So you can see there the old railway buildings have been restored and they're now um, it's quite a beautiful retail uh, building for a sports brand. So it's kind of a good example of what you can do with um, old heritage buildings without actually damaging uh, the fabric of the buildings. So I'm not sure if um, many of you have taken the Kilkenny Famine Experience Tour, but the project that started from the story of the two Saul brothers um, and from me bringing people around, uh, being an absolutely terrible historian and probably being factually incorrect, meant that I uh, saw the need really to create a professional tour uh, created by lo our local historian, Finn Dwyer, actually put the tour content together for me. Um, we used the pictures of our workhouse. Uh, um, the tour is actually, it's an audiovisual tour. So it brings you around different points of the workhouse and it tells you stories of life in Kilkenny in the workhouse from different perspectives. Um, as you move around the buildings and we use video and we use audio to retell the stories. So it marries the human stories from the minutes um, of the workhouse and also from the local newspapers. And it also interweaves uh, the research that was done by the likes of Johnny Heber and others. Mainly Johnny, his research has been an absolute gift to Ireland and to Kilkenny. Um, and the tour takes about 40 minutes and it's free. And you can book it online or you can just pop in and come and take the tour. And to date, we launched in um, 2017. And to date, we've had uh, just over 9,000 people uh, come in and take the tour. So I would encourage anyone that hasn't already come in and taken the tour to do that. As I was um, trying to uh, get the tour going and, and find someone who would give me some money towards it, <coughs> excuse me, I kept thinking about the number, the number of people that had uh, died and that were found in the workhouse um, burial plot. <coughs> and I wanted to represent the number. So we came up with an idea that would connect the community back to those people on a one by one to one basis. And that was the community inclusion project. So we brought people into uh, McDonough um, and we presented the history of the site to them and we asked them to leave of their fingerprints. Luckily for us, it was a year before GDPR. So we were allowed to gather 975 fingerprints, which we actually etched in brass. Um, and we used that to enhance the look of the limestone crypt. And uh, each of those people um, learned a little bit about the person that they represented. So because of Johnny Gieber's research, and I don't know if many of you have had the chance to read his book. Um, he actually lists all of the famine remains at the back of it. Uh, each of them has a number, but he also tells us a little bit about the person, whether it was a man or a woman. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Any markers of disease on their remains. Um, so that gave the community a chance to um, feel that they were connected to one of the people buried. And then the last part of the project was uh, the memorial statue or the sculpture. I'm going to, this is the sculpture here. Excuse me now, because I just need to have a cough for some reason. I'm obviously not used to talking to people for so long. So um, <laughs> the family experience sculpture is um, <clears throat> representative of the two boys, uh, John and Patrick Saul. And uh, sorry, excuse me, <laughs> I caught up. It, uh, it, we wanted to show um, a piece of artwork that would depict hope, hope that those boys um, were helping each other along on their journey. And that's what you see there in the, the bronze sculpture. 
So the sculpture uh, was placed at Memorial Garden. So what was a very plain limestone script um, is now a place of remembrance and the fingerprints of the community were etched into the brass and you can see that in the background there. So we just enhanced the whole area and just made it a lot more special. And you can see in the picture here, the community involvement. So TJ Carey was one of the 975 people that came in and left us his fingerprint. And um, I thought it was very important that we recorded the names of the participants in uh, a special book, and that's what DJ has in his hands there. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a photograph of uh, some of the people that came and took part in the project. And you can see there uh, Richard Andrews, the ambassador to Australia, who was a big supporter of the project. and. Uh, the ambassador in the UK was the same as well. Just give me one second, I just want to clear my throat. Thanks, I can normally talk for hours uninterrupted, so I must be under pressure tonight. So we had a lot of interest in the project uh, across the community, but also uh, we had some local um, support politically. And there you can see uh, John McGuinness and John Paul Seelan um, bringing me to the Dáil to meet the Minister for Heritage at the time, Heather Humphreys. I think the guys realised that I had no funding for this project. Um, and when it started, it was to be the tour and then it became the community project. And then I rang my... Um, landlords and I said guys I need a sculpture and uh, it's probably going to cost a few bob so I was constantly kind of begging borrowing and stealing to try and get the money to get this project across we didn't have any sort of project consultants it was really um we were doing this as on a shoestring budget and um the response from people in the community was phenomenal and the response from some local businesses uh, was really great as well because when I needed something done people would say, yeah, I'll do that for you. And I'm not, not, I won't charge you for it. And it was all about sharing the story of uh, the people that um, had lived in the workhouses. So it became this massive uh, community uh, collaborative uh, effort, which just has been so special all the way along. <coughs> so um, as we were getting ready to launch the event, we invited the people that had taken part in the community project back to McDonough for the unveiling of the sculpture and the fingerprints and the launch of the audiovisual tour. So this is just some photographs from that really special day. Um, and you can see here, there was four schools that came together to learn music to enhance the event. Uh, and it was just, uh, some of you may have been there, it was a, a very special day for the community. Uh, this is Johnny Gieber, and Johnny is uh, extremely generous with all of his research. <coughs> Sorry, I have to be coughing there. And this is one of the events where he travelled back to Ireland and, and came down to Kilkenny to uh, show us what he was working on. Um, so it's great, and I'm in touch with Johnny still um, nearly on a monthly basis. Actually, we sent each other some communication this week. Uh, so he continues to just give his knowledge so freely, um, which has been fundamental to my ability then to tell the stories of the workhouse um, and the research that remains and, and goes on for the people that were buried here. Uh, um, Johnny is still working on projects to, to actually further the research into the Kilkenny burials. So it's very exciting to think that there's more that can come from this research. There's been a lot of interest um, in the project um, across the country and as far across um, into London as well, where we've we've gone over and represented um, the project at uh, award ceremonies over in London. So this is just some of the PR and publicity that came from it. 
Um, this is uh, the two boys that we used to um, replicate uh, John and Patrick Saul. Uh, and that was a campaign that took any tourism ran, uh, dig a little deeper. So that's them in one of the um, uh, one of the yards at the workhouse. Uh, again, this is just some more press coverage. So you can see here, St. Kieran's College had come over, uh, all left their fingerprints. Um, and then another piece where Johnny was in Kilkenny giving us his um, latest research. The story of the two brothers uh, is interesting and it's definitely something that has potential for further uh, work and it's, it's, it's actually something that I would love someone to take on. Uh, I don't have the skill set for it, but we'd love to find their descendants because uh, the sculpture obviously de uh, depicts their story and uh, there is no awareness of where any of their descendants are. So this was a story that was run in the Clanmel Nationalists at the time in an effort to try and find their families because Obviously, it's three generations past and they have an unusual surname, but we actually haven't been successful in finding the, their descendants. Um, it is reported that the older boy went to Australia uh, eight years after, his, after they presented at the workhouse and that he ended up in an asylum and his father uh, appears in the newspapers in Sydney a few times and he actually ends up in an asylum as well. So there was obviously a mental health issue uh, in the family there, but other than that, we don't actually know what happened to the boys. So that's definitely a, a project for the future uh, that I'm going to need some help with. So uh, as part of this project, and as I said, lots of kind of strands uh, and little tangents started to appear. So I was reading the Kilkenny People one day and um, I saw that there was going to be a book launched in Callan. Um, by uh, an Australian historian and actually the reason I went was that the Australian ambassador was going and I had made contact with him but that uh, me going out to Callan on that sunny morning to the workhouse uh, led me to meet uh, Dr Perry McIntyre and Perry McIntyre manages uh, a database of uh, 4,000 4, uh, girls who left Ireland on the Earl Grey scheme um, 59 of those girls left the Kilkenny workhouse and 20 of them uh, went from Callan. This is Perry on a return visit to Ireland. Um, I, I dragged her to Kilkenny the, the following day. She was supposed to be going to Cork and she changed her plan and she came and met me and I was telling her about what we were working on. And actually that's led to a lovely relationship uh, where we've met each other lots of times now and she continues to work on the story of all of the girls that left Ireland, but she has a very strong interest in the girls from Kilkenny. And she recently uh, did a presentation for us as well. And that's the joy of Zoom. She dialed in from Sydney at 11 o'clock at night and uh, we had about 50 people dial in, many of them descendants of the girls that left the Kilkenny workhouse. And um, part of the tangent that led us to further information about the survivors, the Kilkenny orphan girls, showed us uh, launch uh, another project called the Travel Box Project. And this is just an illustration of the names of all of the girls that left Kilkenny and that's in place at the workhouse. So you can see the names of all the girls and the boats that they left on and the years they left. Arising from the story of the survivors and the girls that went out to Australia is the story of Mary Theresa Slattery. And Mary Theresa left our workhouse as an orphan. Uh, she was she was aged 17. This is her husband, William Weeks. He was a convict. She went uh, to Australia and she married him and they had uh, 12 children. 10 of those children survived. Uh, she is one of our orphan girls. But the lovely thing about the story is that we have now met many of her descendants and here in this photograph, you see Janine and Stuart uh, Gerard, and they're in Kilkenny. They've come across, they've been watching everything that was going on uh, with the famine experience, and they watched the launch live, and they started to email me and said, we want to come and trace the, the, the steps of our great-great-grandmother, Mary Theresa Slattery. And the reason that Mary Theresa featured so strongly was that... Um, we actually were gifted um, an orphan travel box. 
it was made by inmates in um, Arbor Hill Prison. And it was presented to us on the day that we launched the tour. And that's just another side project. I met someone at the National Family Commemoration um, who was involved in this travel project, travel box project. And he said to me, I'd like to, um, I'd like to make you a travel box. Have you an orphan girl in mind? I said, yeah, I, I'm very interested in Mary Teresa Slattery. So I said, but time, a timeline is very short now because I said we're going to launch in November. And I think this was September. And he said, we'll get this done. So it's lovely because we now have a memento of Mary Teresa and it features her story. Um, and it also inspires her descendants to come and visit us. <coughs> On the day that we launched, uh, we were really lucky to have her great great granddaughter, uh, Kerry Tupper, who had been emailing me. Johnny Gieber had put me in touch with Kerry uh, because she was reading his research about victims and she emailed him uh, and said, there were survivors from the Kilkenny workhouse, please don't forget. And she said, I'm proof that women went left and survived and went on and made better lives for themselves so immediately Johnny said you need to speak to Marion and Kilkenny there's a lot of work going on there so she's a fabulous person and she started to email me and she was great she was giving me lots of you know just when you'd be getting a little bit tired she'd be saying you know keep going keep going and I emailed her one day and I said look I would love you to come to Kilkenny and I said if you were to ever come I think you should probably come for this launch event so she just made a crazy decision to travel across the world and meet us uh, the night before um, the launch, which was just fantastic. And you can see her here at the unveiling of the sculpture. Um, and she was also the person that we presented the, the orphan box to. She was unaware of all of that side of the project. We were kind of doing it quietly in the background. You can see her in the right, on the right hand side here with her family and She's at the memorial in Sydney to the orphan girls and a number of the orphan girls are named at that memorial and she's pointing to the name of her great great grandmother Mary Teresa Slattery. So it's lovely to have the project come full circle and there are thousands and thousands of people living in Australia who consider themselves Irish through the fact that one of the orphan girls leaving workhouses is one of their ancestors. So that's been amazing and we're making so many links to people in Australia that want to travel back to Kilkenny, that want to see the workhouse and stand in the women's yard and, and, and think about all of the things that their ancestors went through. So that's been a really, really special part of the story for me. And I, I've developed such lovely friendships with, with all of these people. I, I normally bring them out to the workhouse in Callan and we have a little sneaky look out there. Uh, and then we normally go and we sit and we have cake in um, in in Callan and hit High Bank Orchard and uh, share stories there and they normally end up at my kitchen table or you know we go out and have some Irish music with them so it's just been such a wonderful project in so many ways that way it's just given me so much um, which has been lovely. These are just some of the awards that the project has uh, earned so far we were actually the sculpture was awarded the Business to Arts Award um, in 2019, which was just amazing. When I um, pictured a sculpture on the site, uh, I went out to a few people um, who came back with very harrowing drawings. And I just said, I, I really want the sculpture to be beautiful. I wanted to depict hope. I wanted to show survival. Um, and I had worked with um, Annie Mollero. She had um, done an exhibition with us uh, during the arts festival actually interested me in the Good Shed building at the time. And I just thought she was a really special person. So I rang her and I said, would you come in? Um, would you come into my office? I want to have a chat with you. And I, I told her the story of the boys. And I just said, could you create something uh, that depicts their story? So that's where the sculpture came from. And she actually won um, this Business to Arts Award, which was lovely because um, very at the very early stages she said I think I think this might win the business to arts award but at the time it was such a blue sky thing like hope for her uh, so that was another really special night where where her work was honored um, in Dublin on a national award we also uh, were shortlisted twice with the good causes award they were very good to us um, <clears throat> in terms of exposure and telling the story and 
people still say to me, oh, I went into Centre there and I could see your picture up on the at the National Lottery. And they kept saying when they came down to Kilkenny to look at the project, they kept saying, this is so important. This is so special. And um, they said, we don't normally do misery. We normally do happy stuff. You know, we're, we're not really into the misery side of, of projects. Uh, but they said, but we want to support this as much as we can. So that was that was really nice support as well. We've also won uh, really special awards from Kilkenny Beautiful uh, Scepter Awards in London and the other little purple uh, circle is a purple apple merit award again in London. So interesting to go to London and pick up awards for uh, famine, famine work in Ireland. Uh, so we're trying to uh, keep the story alive and uh, keep the memory of the very special people that lived um, in the workhouse in Kilkenny alive. Um, and I suppose the oral history of the site was forgotten. Um, there was no written recorded history. So the whole concept was to bring the people that died there back into human memory and to record it in a way that they'll never be forgotten again. And it was that was that was our our one big objective. And I think we've we've hit that objective. And I suppose if we were to think about what we want to do into the future, I think Kilkenny is so unique um, in terms of the opportunity to create something really, really special of a national or international standard visitor centre around the heritage of the, the Irish famine because when you think about the research um, and the opportunity that um, has been given to us from these people that didn't survive the famine um, in the ability to, to analyse their remains, to tell their story uh, that is um, unheard of anywhere else in, in Ireland and interestingly has uh, repercussions across the world. There was a lady that was doing her PhD with Johnny. Um, she had come from Texas and she went to work with Johnny because she wanted to look at our skeletal remains. And she said that the, the, the impact of starvation and famine on community could be seen in the bones of our victims. And that can inform government policy across the world. Do you know the, the importance of preventing starvation, the importance of preventing these famine situations because it has generations, there's implications for generations. Um, so all of that stuff is still kind of live and coming through um, from the Kilkenny famine experience. Um, so it's a project I think that um, will just grow and grow with time, hopefully. So that's the end of my presentation. I will uh, stop my share. Neil and Margaret Marion, um, you know, Orin to uh, Bina Ogunig and Shina Haring Conquina, um, con on Loch a hashbond doing, and I think that's what you've done. Sometimes we need as people to be, um, to be brought or helped to remember, and uh, it's very easy coming from an archaeologist, it's very easy sometimes for things to be left in an archaeological report, and that's where a lot of these things stay. And I think you just deserve a massive amount of credit for seeing smiling faces of the ancestors of the people that were, you know, managed to survive and to look at the light instead of the dark. And I think, like you said, it's so easy sometimes to look at the darkness in these things. And these people never wanted to end up in this workhouse. These people never wanted to be buried in this workhouse. And to see it from where I saw it 14 odd years ago, to see it to where it's become now, I think you just deserve a massive amount of credit and to have that drive and that passion for so long to remember and to help everyone else remember. I just, uh, hats off. I think it's uh, it's absolutely fantastic what you've done. Thanks so much, Ben. I really appreciate that. It's um, it's one of those things that, you know, you go in to manage a building and um, you're dealing with, you know, the commercial realities and, and the physical realities of a building of its size. And it's um, uh, the nature of the building can be tricky at times to say the least, but then something happens and you get, you might get an email from Australia or someone will phone you for like, I recently had a phone call from the UK uh, from a group who are trying to commemorate uh, a famine um, graveyard over there. And they said, we, we want to come over and see what you're doing. And you kind of just shelve all your day-to-day -day work and you say, this, this is what really, this is what uh, gets, gets me going uh, in a lovely way. But it, it's just people's, uh, people's care, people's compassion. Um, across every strand of the project. It has just been so rewarding. It's, it's phenomenal, really. And it's, it's funny because a lot of the people tonight, I think, are kind of sharing that similar. I think, uh, I think it was Joe here somewhere at the start. He said something that kind of stood out, which I'm going to read. 
Uh, no, it's Paul Cully actually there on the job performance. This is Marin, your humility as regards not being a trained historian is best set aside. Your expertise and commitment to reclaiming the stories of these unfortunate people is better than that of many trained historians. I am full of admiration for the work you have done and continue to do. Well done. You should be given an honorary degree for your efforts. There you go. Here, Thank you, Paul. Doesn't... Thank you, Paul. Paul's been a great support to me. Uh, I'm about to get a real degree, Paul, but I had to work for it, so... Uh, and it's nothing to do with history either. So I'll have to start again on that one. Thank you. Um, and I, there's a, a few questions come in. They've come in personally and publicly. So I'm going to I'll ask you the ones that have come in straight to me first off. Um, uh, what do you think of the impact um, having, let's say, from the point of view of this place, not necessarily being recorded, as you said, in oral history? And the fact that now that the community is aware um, that this was in their city, what do you think has the impact on the people of the of Kilkenny has been since finding all of these various things about their history? It's a very interesting question. I think when we first took on the management of the building, there was an awful lot of upset in the local community that this burial site had been found and we were this big commercial entity and maybe we weren't the right things weren't being done. All of that was kind of floating around and um at the time, Donny Butler was the manager in the shopping centre. I was operations manager and um, we kind of were, were trying to kind of keep keep up with everything that was happening and, and learn about, you know, the, the correct thing to do uh, when human remains are found. And, and the correct thing to do now is uh, a licence and, and uh, an organised excavation. Um, but I think the famine experience and specifically the community connection project um, made people aware of firstly that it had happened and secondly that it was very important to us it was as important to us to honor them and to actually have someone connect to each of them as an individual and I think the oral history oral history is so important and I know now we have the technology to record so much more and it's very important that Ireland does record the oral history that you know that a, a chunk of of a population can't be forgotten again like that um but we we had a lovely um uh, thing happen there uh in the middle of covid a neighbor uh, who had taken part in the project uh sent me an email she asked me if I'd meet her and she wanted to write a a poem about the little girl that she had connected to um, and we unveiled that at the memorial garden there a couple of months ago and it was really special i mean that's it's the type of project that so many people are just so engaged and that's what it's about the project isn't for me it's not for our team at mcdonough it's for the whole community um, and the more things like that that happen the more special it becomes and, and the more people are reminded you know, of the, the, the humanity of the people that, that didn't survive. Yeah, and, and I suppose you, you often find that in terms of archaeology, so I remember it myself, people being kind of appalled at the fact that this was, you know, being uncovered, but at the end, of, like I said before, they, they never wanted to be buried there in the first place, and what you've managed to do, I think, is forge a connection between the people that were left on the ground and the local community, and that connection, obviously, is now showing people that, you know, they actually own this space and the people that were attached to it, so... um. There's a, a few kind of people have kind of a, a couple of similar questions, but they're all along the same line. And on the topic of John, Johnny Gieber, I can recommend it myself. I've read it a few times and it's an absolutely fantastic, accessible book um, for anyone that wants to, to check it out. Um, but there's a few questions coming in terms of DNA and there people are asking, has there been any DNA? Will there be any DNA or where does that stand as, as it's at the moment? Yeah, another great question. Um, there were fragments, rib fragments retained in the National History Museum. Uh, so the potential for DNA is there. I, I'm told it's extremely expensive, uh, but wouldn't it be wonderful if we could actually trace those people? Um, but uh, talking to Johnny, he doesn't think that there's an appetite in Ireland or funding to do so. Uh, but yeah, the potential is there. There are fragments uh, retained. Um, and like in a case that, um, access is needed to the human remains the crypt is designed in a way that you could actually access and do further research as well 
And lastly, very, very fine one, I won't keep you too much longer. Um, people are kind of wondering where, where now for the experience? So um, this mentioned a few different things about what you've achieved so far, but what's in your mind, okay, getting the story out there and showing the world just how a significant a place this is, um, but where for you is the next big step? Yeah, thanks for asking. I think um, we have a physical space in the workhouse um, and the potential is there for a top class, world class um, visitor, uh, visitor space where people can come and uh, learn the stories, not just of the Kilkenny famine experience, but the Irish famine experience. I was in Berlin a few years ago and I went to the memorial to the Jews. It's um, just such um, an evocative space and it was so simplistic and it was based on human story. Um, and it just used technology to recreate, I suppose, the sensory feelings of what may, may have happened um, in, to, to those people. And I thought to myself, I was so moved coming out and I thought to myself, this is what we need to do for the famine experience. I mean, I think we don't really hit the mark when we put reams of information up on walls and expect children and young teenagers to come and visit a museum and read and read and read and maybe there's a little wheelbarrow in the corner or there's you know artifacts that just don't engage and i think with the advent of digitalization and, and like ai and virtual reality and all that kind of thing and then uh, paired with all of the research that the kilkenny famine victims have given us there's massive potential in kilkenny for something really world class um, and that's that would be my dream that's where I started a file on this about um, 10 years ago and it's, a, it's on my computer and it's called Museum. <clears throat> and, and that's it, Museum would be, and a proper uh, top class modern museum would be the dream. And I think as, a, as an addition to that would be genealogy. So, so many people that I've heard say, I, I want to trace my family, where do I go? And so Kenny doesn't have proper genealogical uh, facilities for people like me that wouldn't know where to start and I think there's huge potential for that as well um, to reach out to the people across the world that left Ireland um, in a way that would give them support someone in the room or you know modern technology in the room to show them exactly how they can trace back burial records and all that kind of thing and finding the boys finding the two Saul brothers would be amazing well, it sounds well. like, um, yeah, you've, you've got a, a, a very clear goal in mind. I have to say again, Mary, it's just, it's fantastic just seeing it. And I haven't seen, you know, what's been going on and I've been away from Kilkenny for so long and to see it from, from the ground, from when I saw it in the clay to see where it is now, I just, it's really, it's, it's quite emotional to see them and to see what you've done. And uh, I, I really think you deserve massive credit. And I think, you know, like you say, I've said before, you're focused on the light instead of the dark. And I think that's, that's a, that's a lovely touch that you have. And uh, you're obviously very connected to these people and they're going to stay with you for a long time. So thank you very much for that. Stephen. It was brilliant. Thanks so much. Thanks to yourself and Liam for the invitation. Uh, it's been lovely. Thank you. Facebook is Keep a watch on Trasnatira's Facebook page for upcoming lectures. Thank you all very much for watching in Torera, August Bintana Vasan I'm sure. Enjoy the good weather. Slan Slan.